going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Hey, it is terrible back there. That's what I mean. Call. Call. Call city council. Call, call the city manager and tell them that this is the 10th day has passed. When are they going to cut the cemetery? We have 2,000 veterans in here on Memorial Day. When are they going to cut the cemetery? This is shameful. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. The situation at the Wesleyan Cemetery in Northside has been disgraceful for years. The owner, Bob Merkel, was found guilty of literally robbing the assets of the cemetery and was sent to prison for a year and a half. Now he's out of prison and he threatens anybody who tries to clean the place up. And things have gotten worse rather than better. Local 12 reporter Rich Jaffe profiled the situation last week. To walk through Wesleyan Cemetery is to stroll through a field of memory and misery. For the second day in a row, Pam Wright and her husband showed up ready to cut whatever was necessary to find the graves of their nine family members. It's very frustrating, and especially for the elderly that have to come out here and see the people buried in here. They can't even find their graves. After serving 18 months for stealing $93,000 in cemetery funds, owner Robert Merkel was released from prison last year. While he was gone, the volunteer group Friends of Wesley and maintained the property. We've been donating our time. We've been donating our equipment, everything. When is Mr. Merkel going to donate? This past February, in an effort to get Merkel to relinquish control of the cemetery, the Ohio Attorney General filed suit against him. But while the legal issues are in play, the volunteers have been cautioned to leave the place alone. Because Merkel's out of prison and he still says he's the owner, and because of the litigations going on, we can't come in here and cut without going to jail. Well, the Attorney General says he believes both the county and the city have a responsibility to maintain this once hallowed ground. Right now, it's once again a no man's land. Rich Jaffe, Local 12. To discuss a proposal to deal once and for all with the mess at Wesleyan Cemetery, I am joined by Hamilton County Commissioner Todd Cortoon and David Pepper, a member of Cincinnati City Council. In both cases, welcome back to uh, Newsmakers. Dan, thank you. Good morning. Good to see you. Um, why is this, Todd, a continuing mess? I mean, it would seem like here's Merkel. He was convicted of, of having stolen at least 93000 from the place, yet he's technically still owner and he seems to have control. Why is this still a mess? Well, it, it shouldn't be a mess, first of all, but it is in part because Mr. Merkel uh, has failed to take his responsibility seriously, but more than that, he has threatened anybody who's tried to act responsibly with legal action. For example, the friends of Wesleyan or city or county officials that may come on to the property. He's threatened them with legal action if people come on to the property and attempt to do the right thing. So that's in part the answer, but in, in part the answer also has been, uh, regrettably, the lack of both city and county in stepping up to the plate and doing what is their legal statutory responsibility here and, and this has been going on for several years issues have been put forward proposals have been put forward but to date uh, neither I at the county nor, nor David at the city have been able to secure the the necessary approvals to take the next step but well, we think we're we're on the right track toward and we're going to talk on. about that plan in just a minute what what's the legal ability why why does the county even have a, a claim to to be able to operate here on a, from a legal perspective? It's very simple. Under the Ohio Revised Code, the county has statutory responsibility to maintain and preserve veterans' monuments and memorials in certain circumstances, veterans' graves. At Wesleyan Cemetery, there are a number of veterans' monuments and memorials, including uh, a memorial to the first Surgeon General of the United States of America who was buried there at Wesleyan. There are also close to 2,000 veterans' graves at Wesleyan that are in an abandoned situation. So because of, of those facts and because of that statutory responsibility, the county has a role to play here, and it is a mandatory, obligatory role for the county to step in. David, what about the city? Does the city have any legal 
one, responsibility, or two, legal ability to step into the situation. Yeah, we believe we do as well. If you saw in the photos there the ridiculously high weeds, and that's a part of our job as a city is after we find someone for not, vial for not following our, our basic health code with weeds being limited to a certain height, we can come onto a property and also take care of that. So, so that, that under that alone, we can we can do that, and we do that on a lot of private properties throughout the city. That could be, yeah, that could be an individual homeowner who's letting their property grow, or it could be a big, a big place right. like like Westland, which mm -hmm. is, as I understand, 24 acres, uh, something think like 17,000 graves there. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a yeah. this is a big and a very old cemetery right. dating back to the 1840s. To be fair to the city. I want to point out that on Thursday of this week, city crews were out there trying to do something, trying to start cleaning up again. But this is a start and stop. What we need is something that's longer term. Right. Is that right? Yeah, we on the city's end, we have a lot of properties with weed problems, and we try and get to them. And I asked on Monday that this needs to be bumped up on the priority list, and I'm glad to see we're being responsive. But you know this. This can't go on where we, we, we hear citizens' concerns, legitimate concerns, then we try to respond and then it goes away. I think that the, the real solution is to come up with a broader plan, an ongoing plan, to fix it once and for all. Todd, you've been trying to work on the outlines of a plan for some time. Can you just sort of sketch that out, what you think would be a long-term plan here? Sure, and, and actually this effort goes back now over two years in terms of trying to put together the, the pieces for providing for the permanent maintenance and care of, of this cemetery and, and the graves in perpetuity. I believe that the city and the county can easily partner uh, in resources and materials that we have uh, and also partner with Cincinnati State um, in order to provide the, the vehicle that will allow for the cemetery to be taken care of in, in perpetuity. Two simple things. Um, city and the county need to come together and underwrite the cost of the equipment and materials that are necessary to maintain the cemetery. When you're talking about equipment, we're talking about we're talking mowers, about gasoline, exactly. that kind of they, stuff. Exactly. Those sorts of uh, yard tools, in, in essence, okay. the, the, the things necessary to maintain a, a property like this. The county then also can bring resources to bear through the county's adult probation department and make this a part of the community service of adult probationers in Hamilton County. They're already doing things like this elsewhere throughout the county, so this would just be one other uh, from example. An from a legal point of view, from an insurance point of view, it's okay to use probationers for this kind of thing? Yes, it is, and, and we use probationers to cut down weeds in a variety of other places. Okay. Probationers we use to, to uh, keep up Hillcrest Cemetery in, out in Anderson Township, So probationers example. aren't paid for their time Correct. because they owe time to the community. That's right. And so that there's no cash outflow for them? No cash outflow at all. And it, it's a, a resource that we have that is used elsewhere for this type of a purpose. It can be brought to bear to, to be used here. And that actually reduces significantly the cost of maintaining the cemetery. We've received estimates of around $5,000 per acre from contractors to maintain the cemetery. But the bulk- Per, per year, right? Per, per year, yes. Okay. But the bulk of that cost is in the labor. And so if you take the labor out, then the cost is, is very, very manageable. There's a third factor here, though, and that is who's going to oversee all of this, take on the, the mantle of responsibility of, of overseeing this. And I propose that city and county uh, partner and approach Cincinnati State. Cincinnati State has a cemetery management course curriculum in place. This would provide a living laboratory for the students at the college in, in order to get a real hands-on experience in terms of cemetery management. And uh, that partnership of city, county, and, and Cincinnati State could provide the, uh, the vehicle uh, under which we could provide for the maintenance and care of the cemetery in perpetuity. David, what's your reaction to the outline of this plan, as, as Todd has, has sketched well, out here? I think we're on the same page. Uh, I actually have had a very good relationship with adult probation as well. As Todd mentioned, we have some great partnerships Adult probation probationers have helped clean up our Cincinnati uh, neighborhood business district for the last several years as well. And, and as I saw this appear, I'm I'm newer to the issue. That was one of my first thoughts. And so I think it's a it is a very very good partnership. I think the Cincinnati State angle makes a lot of sense. So uh, I, and I also think you know you don't want to 
if someone else doesn't do the job, you first want to make sure you're holding them accountable and they can do it. But in this case, it's clear. If we don't step up, it's just going to continue to be an absolute mess. So I think we, we owe it to the citizens to Given uh, the make fact this work. that Merkel has stripped out the endowment, stripped out the value in this cemetery, is there any reason to expect either a private individual or a 501c3 um, to ever come in and take over this cemetery again? I mean, there's no resources left. I mean, it, it, are we just, is the public just stuck with this forever now? Well, I think that that's really the issue, is um, to, to get to a point where we don't continually start and start and start again in, in trying to provide uh, the, the vehicle to take care of the cemetery. Merkel has stripped away all of the, the resources, and, and of course, he is the primary party who has primary responsibility, and if he has any assets at all or, or financial resources at all that we can go after, we should, and I know that we will, to try to, to underwrite this. But beyond that, at the end of the day, uh, the county has statutory responsibilities, the city has statutory responsibilities, and, and we need to fulfill our responsibility here and make sure that we uh, resolve this issue so it's not a problem year after year after year. Very practical question. Any estimate, it sounds like, okay, labor's, you're, you've got a plan for the labor, you've got a plan to oversee management. What about the cost of equipment and the ongoing cost of the gasoline, the maintenance of that equipment? Any estimate on dollar outlays that we're looking at here that, that the two entities have to come up with? We are in the process right now of, of parsing out the labor from the materials and, and some of the estimates that we've received. So I don't have that exact figure, Dan. All I can say is that the estimates that we received originally were $5,000 per acre per year, but uh, the, the vast majority of that is, is labor, and so it, it's going to be some figure substantially less than that. One of the issues here is <coughs> this happens to be a large cemetery. Um, but there are lots of older cemeteries that get abandoned, privately owned, family plots, et cetera, mm -hmm. all over the city, all over the county. Mm -hmm. Does this set a dangerous precedent that if you handle it this way for this cemetery, you're going to find yourself holding the bag on a lot of other things? Um, if I might answer first, I, I would say no. Uh, we took a look at that as a county when, when I first raised this issue two years ago. Um, we did an inventory of cemeteries in the county that might be in a similar condition. And the reality is, is that there are not that many cemeteries countywide that you would, would look at in the same vein as you look at a, a Wesleyan. But beyond that, Dan, the, the precedent here is Ohio law. And the precedent is the county fulfilling its statutory responsibility to veterans under Ohio law. And I think that we not only have a legal obligation, but we have a moral obligation to those individuals who sacrificed so much and to their family members to make certain that their final resting places are places of dignity and are places of respect. And to that end, if there is a cemetery in the county that contains veterans' memorials or, or veterans' graves that is abandoned and no one is stepping up to take care of it, well, we need to fulfill our legal and our moral responsibility. David, I want to give you a chance. Are you concerned at all about precedent setting here? I mean, I agree with Todd on, on his last point. You know, I, I am a little bit, but this is a pretty unique situation where someone has actually served jail time. I don't think that's a precedent that other, other people in charge of cemeteries are going to want to follow anyway. So I think at this point, it's, it's clear to me that there is no other, there's not going to be a party that steps up. We're in the end, the ones that have to take care of it as we're required to, and I think as we should. But this is, I think, way down the end of the line, and I think if we basically enforce the laws before this well, and we make sure we hold people accountable, it won't get to this point very often at all. David, have you had a chance to talk about this proposal with your fellow council members? I have not. This, this has come up quickly, and I think that, I think that uh, without speaking for them, I think it's, it's a, it seems like a pretty straightforward win-win and the, the, the one thing you, you mentioned is the cost and figuring that out but if we can this is one of the great examples where you if you work regionally if you have a good cooperation we share the cost we bring in other resources like Cincinnati State and we solve a problem that, that involves our citizens and our veterans 
um, as the county will. And I think that for that reason, I think it's a pretty attractive uh, way to solve this. Todd, what about your side, your end of Court Street? Um, have you had a chance to, to talk to your fellow commissioners about this? And there's only two of two other commissioners. Uh, all I need is one, unlike David, who needs to persuade four other people. Uh, actually, it, virtually this identical proposal uh, I made oh, about two years ago and was unable at that point to get the support of one other commissioner, um, e neither John Dallin nor, nor Tom Nyer at the time. Um, John Dallin is still there, but we've had a change on the county commission since then in the form of Commissioner Phil Heimlich. And uh, I'm very hopeful that Commissioner Heimlich will be receptive to this. And, and of course, the fact of the matter is Ohio Attorney General Jim Petro took legal action, naming not just Merkel, but the city and the county because yeah. of the failure of both city and county to do what they should have done. And, and really the heck of this is that two years later we're still, we're still discussing and arguing about this. So we, we really need to get it done. I'm almost out of time, but why would people not support this two years ago? Why couldn't you find that other vote two years ago? I, it's a mystery to me still to this Don't day. Don't you have I, a similar I, situation with Hillcrest Cemetery in, in very, Anderson Township? Very similar. And uh, in fact, in the case of Commissioner Dallin, he was not only supportive of county involvement there, he helped lead the charge. So why not here? I, I really can't explain that. It's inside the city of Cincinnati. <laughs> I don't know. This is, and, and we're it, out of time. It needs to be done. We're out of time. It needs to be done. And in a larger less specific sense, what David was saying, this is one of those issues that maybe city and county really can work together on. We pay so much attention to when they, the two entities can't work together. It seems to me around veterans, graves, and this sort of situation, this ought to be something we could bring people together on. And yeah. thank you for both of your work uh, on this issue, and uh, we're going to follow this. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, okay. Dan. Stay tuned. After the break, a local organization designed to provide help for Cincinnati women. Welcome back. The range of issues facing women is great, especially women, many of whom trying to raise children, who are afflicted with mental illness or addiction to drugs or alcohol. Woman Ways is a multifaceted community-based organization working to address the needs of women on the north side of Cincinnati. I am joined this morning by Winifred uh, Bean Kessler, the founder and clinical director of Woman Ways, and Paula Bennett Powell, a psychologist who works with another organization, First Step. Welcome to Newsmakers. Thank Let's you. start out by talking about Woman Ways. What, it's been around for a long time. What is it? Well, Woman Ways is a community organization which is um, 27 years old, going on 28. We were founded by people who attended a workshop and a public dialogue between Margaret Mead and Phyllis Chesler. Um, the next day at workshop, actually this was on the day Cincinnati had the worst weather in its history, when the Ohio River froze and there was four feet of snow and all 500 people who, were, who had reservations showed up, hmm. despite Procter & Gamble closing. <laughs> and what kind of programs, what kind of things do you do? Our mission is to do things that are not being done by any other agencies or organizations, but which, are, which we know are a crying need because of the clients who come to us for counseling or consultation or coaching. And currently, of course, we've identified the problem with women who are uh, addicted, mentally ill, with children, on the streets into prostitution, or solving their problems in a way that brings them into the courts. Okay. Now, Paula, your organization, uh, and there's going to be a joint program, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute, but First Step, what is First Step? First Step Home is a nonprofit organization. It is a, a residential treatment program for women and their children. Uh, the women who come to us are um, uh, addicted to substances. About 70% uh, of them also have mental health uh, diagnoses. Um, so we work with women on a 24-hour uh, a day basis for three to six months. Uh, we also have a family and uh, child program. We provide on-site on daycare for the women who want to bring their children into treatment with them. Mm -hmm. We provide family counseling and we provide parent education. And how many women at any one time can you be caring for? 
16. 16 women, mm -hmm. and some of those are going to have their children with them, so yes. you, it gets fairly complex. Yes, it does. Now, Winifred, you were mentioning that one of your focal points right now is this issue of women who find themselves uh, addicted, maybe mentally ill, but also uh, choosing driven into prostitution. Yes. How much of a problem is that in Cincinnati? Well, it's quite a large problem. As Paula said, this facility, First Step Home, which is a wonderful facility, and a friend of mine for almost uh, 35 years, Margot Spence, is the director. She and I actually are responsible for the program in coming into existence on the 17th. Um, and the problem with the city is that we have uh, over a thousand women who are arrested for prostitution. Um, and we don't even have room for them in the jails, much less in treatment programs. I, you probably saw recently it, the decision was made to arrest the women and then not put them in jails. Well, that, as much as it may seem repugnant to some people, that one time or that brief time in jail gave them protection, some food, and so on. So, again, we have a discrimination here in the community which I think is kind of hidden. The facilities for men and the services for men who have a similar situation are much more ample. So you're saying that there are as, as many as a thousand women who uh, uh, more than a thousand who are caught up in this. Yes. And now they could be arrested, so they end up with a record, oh, yes. but they don't end up with any sort of of well, base facility. Well, even if they're fortunate enough to get into treatment, the limited capacity of the treatment facilities we have currently means that most of them don't get there. But even if they do, treatment is the first step. Rehabilitation is the second step. And the critical step that, that's totally missing almost here is transition. That's where they learn to live a healthy way at, at, with their children. Mm -hmm. And the children, the facilities that can take women with children, which is first step. And is, is this the type of thing that first step is, is working on? Is, are some of the women that you're dealing with facing exactly the, this situation? Yes. yes, they are. And is there is there a model for helping women get transitioned away from that life? Yes, we have a continuing care program um, for our women after they step down from the uh, substance abuse residential program. Then we work with them, uh, providing them with counseling and case management and lifestyle change issues. And we actually provide housing for them. and. Um, during the time that they are put initially put into the housing, they are um, looking for jobs or going t uh, to school. They have several months before they have to start actually paying rent. Okay. And the, the co continuing care goes on as long as a woman is willing to participate in it. Winifred, uh, it is, you have an event on, a joint event on June the 17th, and one of the speakers is, as you mentioned, Margot Spence with First Step from Cincinnati. The but director. You're, all, you're also bringing someone else yes. in. Tell, tell us about that and why that's a model. Okay, well, Dr. Powell, I believe, has been with First Step on only a few months. Margo, of course, has been there much longer. She and I have been talking about the programs that exist nationally for over a year. Um, we're bringing in Sister Marietta Fritz from uh, Saginaw, Michigan. She was, we were put in contact with her uh, by Sister Elizabeth Marie Boyer, who is the provincial of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur. Uh, Marietta was here as the first mentor model of our Woman Ways New Swans program, which is the savvy women and men active in the north side of Cincinnati, deliberately chosen because we were trying to get away from that Cincinnati conflictual thing of east-west east, west, neighborhood. Yeah, right. yeah, we're really big into this crossing boundaries and divisiveness and getting people connected. And, and I, I, I'm aware of time here, so this program in Saginaw is different than yes, typical programs. Yes, we've investigated the program in San Francisco where their Johns are being arrested, they're paying money for services, and that's a good program. It's much the program in Saginaw, though, that Sister Marietta has put in place, she's a Cincinnatian, by the way, who went to Saginaw because she couldn't get funded in Cincinnati. She has eight homes up there. Saginaw is one-sixth the size of Cincinnati. We and don't have homes. anything like that. Let me put up the slate about the information about this uh, event. It's June the 17th, Sister Marietta Fritz and Margot Spence. 
uh, June the 17th, and it'll be at 5419 Hamilton Avenue. 5914. 5914 Hamilton Avenue, I can't type. <laughs> and the telephone number for information and reservation, 751-7003. Or email womanways at fuse.net. Womanways fuse.net. Thank you very much for being Thank here you, this Dan. morning. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your work in the community. Thank you. Thank you for making Local 12 Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. We leave you this morning with some very sad scenes from Wesleyan Cemetery on Memorial Day 2004. But I'll go over before we leave and I'll do our people. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to do some of these others just to make a statement if nothing else. Somebody has to do something.